Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Today we're going to talk about diet and how it relates to your brain health. Um, there's increasing research that what we eat has a lot to do with how healthy our brains are. So today I'm really happy that we're joined by Dr. Hussein Yassin. He is from USC's um, Center for uh, Preventative um, Brain. Is it Preventative Brain Health? Did I say that right? <laughs> Personalized brain health. Personalized brain health. That's correct. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, um, Hussein. This is a topic that we had a lot of focus on because it seems like the research is really growing around um, really what we eat and how that directly relates to our brain health. So tell us exactly um, how much we know so far. So we know a little bit. We know in certain areas... Uh, that certain dietary patterns uh, are associated with better brain health. And we know that other dietary patterns are associated with worse brain health. So um, there has been really elegant studies in the last, I would say, 20, 30 years that have informed us on uh, possibly what works and what not. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to take this kind of one piece at a time because we've read a lot of the research. Um, the Mediterranean diet, the MIND diet is the one that comes up most frequent, um, frequently. And that's, you know, olive oil, high in olive oil, fish, vegetables. Is that still kind of the gold standard for brain health? Or what do we know exactly um, uh, from the research? Yeah, so we know that the MIND diet, which is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, is uh, particularly good for the brain. Um, but we also know that we probably have to move from a concept of a diet to a dietary pattern. And so what do you mean by that? Is that like eating, um, you know, more spaced out meals, less, you know, what does that mean exactly? That means we have to take the whole as opposed to the individual components. Uh, for example, if you've got somebody who loves fast food and you give them an element of the mind diet, it's not going to be similar to somebody who doesn't eat fast food and they're eating the mind diet. So basically you have to take the whole dietary pattern and not just isolate individual components. So what is the direct relationship to, you know, a, a diet that's rich in olive oil and fish and vegetables? Uh, what is, how does that translate into our brains? Very good question. And I think I would have to start by saying that the quality epidemiology data discusses a concept of lifelong dietary patterns and their association with brain health. So we're talking about something that's chronologically happening on the order of many, many years, uh, possibly starting through in middle, middle life. Um, and that means that individuals who are taking a healthy mind or Mediterranean-like dietary pattern uh, are probably consuming a lot of fiber, a lot of good fats, a lot of polyphenols, and those remodel and uh, allow the, the body to um, create a niche or an environment that's protective, whether it's going to be at the level of the gut microbiome or at the level of the blood or maybe at the level of the brain itself. These all interact to help the brain function and to, you know, stave off any risks for diseases like Alzheimer's. Okay. And so there's a couple of things in there that I want to unpack a little bit further. Um, you said, you know, it's, it's the whole package and it matters really what you eat as a kid through your adult. Like, so does that mean, um, is, is any, like, let's say we ate junk food when we were little, and then all of a sudden we adhered to a very strict Mediterranean mind dash diet. Um, can we repair what maybe we did before, or is it a cumulative effect, um, over the course of your lifetime? I think it's it's both. And let me explain. Um, I, I think you're definitely is better switching off no matter what time, but the degree of benefit is probably a function of how long you are on the good diet. So people who have been on the good diet for many years have less risk and less disease than people who have been on the diet for a short amount of time. And 
this question is particularly important in the setting of disease. For example, people who start these healthy diets before they have been a diagnosis of disease tend to have more benefit than after the diagnosis of disease. This is particularly important in the brain because we know that brain cells, once they die or degenerate, it's really hard to regenerate them and dietary interventions may not be effective in doing so. Right. So it, it is, a, 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 but not to say it's not worth it to start to eat healthy if you haven't always, right? There must be like benefit as well to your brain um, if you really change your diet. There is benefit to the brain, but the earlier you start, the better. The better you are. Okay. I know a lot of your um, research has been with lipids, with fats. Um, yeah. One thing I want to clear up because I've been reading the literature on it really matters what type of oil you cook with. Some of it becomes very toxic to the brain. Some of the seed oils, I think it's like, you know, corn, um, uh, some of the hot, like, heating up some oils are actually quite damaging to the brain. Can you tell us a little bit about what we know, whether that's true or not? And really, what do we know about cooking and eating different types of oils? So let me just answer this in, a, in, in two ways. One, I would also, I, I want to reiterate and emphasize the importance of the diet as a whole pattern, as, a, as opposed to an individual component. Because you can possibly have a little bit of bad oil, bad foods, but your body can compensate if the overall pattern is healthy. Um, and the other way is true. If you have a really poor diet and then you add healthy olive oil or something good to your diet, that may not be very effective. So I just want to reiterate this yeah. concept that one ingredient does not seem to do a lot. But let's go back to your question of fried oils. Well, fried oils is part, can actually mean oxidation of oils. They can be damaged oils that can increase disease. And the, as, as when we try to create foods with minimal processing and less frying, I think we can get more benefit from, from the individual components that we're discussing. In terms of, is there any particular oil that can be fried or not? I, I think there isn't really very good research on saying that vegetable oil is superior to corn oil, or you can fry this kind of oil or that oil. But I could tell you that frying polyunsaturated fat is not a good idea because the benefit comes from these uh, unsaturated bonds. These have antioxidant properties. So if you take, for example, uh, olive oil or an omega-3 oil and you deep fry it, you completely destroy that benefit and it's no longer behaving as it's supposed to. Um, okay. Okay. That, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, does this answer your question? Yes, it does. And that's really interesting because I always thought, oh, stay away from the vegetable, the corn oils, you know, and, and um, uh, even grapeseed oil, like the seed oils I, I t was told are very toxic when you heat them up. Um, so then I thought, okay, well then just go to olive oil and cook with olive oil. But then that means I'm not getting the benefits of the olive oil unless I'm like also having a salad where you put the olive oil. Like I think what I'm trying to distill down to as us non-scientists watch this, what are the takeaways in terms of kind of translating those benefits um, of or, or staying away from the things that are harmful to us? What, what do we need to know? Well, don't burn the oil. So let's 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 distinguish heating up oil from burning the oil. So you can take any vegetable corn oil and heat it up and maybe fry with it, and it's good. The problem happens when these oils are past their boiling points and they're burnt, and then the color changes, the smell changes, and you you're seeing black color, and this is particularly worrisome in fast food chains that reuse the oil again and again. But basically, the concept isn't that sophisticated. Any oil that's not polyunsaturated, when you actually heat it up, if it's not burnt, it's probably okay to consume. Mm -hmm. I'm not advocating for using fried food. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that there is a point when even the best oils, when you start burning them and they change color and they change odor and they change their texture, 
you you're dealing with something completely different that's not good right okay so i want to know what lipids have to do with our brain like how are you know i think certain fats are good right it, do they help us like what do we need to know about metabolism especially you know lipids and how that relates to our brain health okay so this is a really good question this, there's a simple answer and there's a complicated answer. The simple answer is that the brain is really made of good lipids, like polyunsaturated fats, and that we need those components because the brain cannot make them from scratch. Uh, the complicated answer is that it's probably a multi-system approach where these good fats are interacting with, with your gut microbiome, with other tissues, that are making it optimal for brain health, whether it's going to be blood flow, blood vessels, liver, adipose tissue, insulin resistance, diabetes. Good fats have pleiotropic effects that can make the brain happy. And it's not as simple as supplying the brain with just a source of fat that it likes. So I, I realize that I'm touching on a complicated topic, but basically, Chronic consumption of good polyunsaturated fat, particularly plant-based polyunsaturated fats, has you know beneficial effects on the body as a whole and on the brain in general, specifically. Okay, so um, so, but from what I'm understanding, we really, I mean, a, a lot, I guess, uh, it depends on what you're ingesting and then how your body is really kind of metabolizing those lipids. Is that correct to say? I mean, but there's not really a direct relate. It's not like, oh, okay, if I only eat this one type of polyunsaturated fat, then I will have a better brain health. Uh, is, is What is that correlation? How do you define yeah, that? We do have to move away from single fats and look at diversity in the diet. I think the concept that I'm trying to, you know, illustrate is that the more diverse your diet is, the more likely you're going to get a lot of beneficial effects. And diversity requires different ingredients that not in only includes fats, but other things. So I, I really want to emphasize, for example, the importance of fiber. Having a, a high fiber diet can significantly remodel these small gut microbiota or, or microbes that are actually eating as we eat. And they produce compounds from our own diet that can go into your brain. Is that so, why, like I've been told, don't drink orange juice in the morning, have an orange, because if you're eating the whole fruit, it has the fiber with it and that serves a purpose, right? For absolutely. absorption. There's yeah. many reasons why fiber is quite important in our diet. It regulates the absorption of sugar in the case of orange and orange juice, but it also regulates trillions of microbes living in us. They outnumber the actual number of cells that we have. They eat with us and we are in a symbiotic relationship. And keeping those diverse, keeping those microbiota diverse by taking in very diverse diet is a good thing. Um, is there a better type of fiber we should be eating? I mean, fiber comes in different shapes and forms, like within fruit or, you know, in grain. So what what do we need to know about eating fiber? What 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 is the best type? Well, I don't think there's a best type. I think there's multiple types of fibers. And the more that you can div diversify your diet, you know, take fiber from whole brands or whole you know, we take fiber from fruits, take fiber from vegetables, take fibers from nuts and seeds. There's many sources of fiber. The point is the more diverse your diet is, the more likely you're going to get benefit. The more restricted your diet is, you're kind of like forcing, you know, certain ingredients to be really high and others not to. And I think the science is telling us diversity is a good thing. Well, I was just going to say, I remember interviewing another scientist who likened the microbiome to a rainforest, right? And the the rainforest can only survive with multi, a lot of diversity within it, right? And every each thing serves a, a different purpose. Would you say that's a, a good analogy to make? That's an excellent analogy. And let's also put omega-3 fats in context because they require this diversity, the rainforest you're discussing, to work. If you just take one element, let's say DHA, which is one of the 
essential omega-3s and take it in isolation, it's not very effective. But if you actually put it in the context of a very diverse nutrient background that contains choline, B12, folic acid, um, short chain fatty acids produced from those microbiome, the same ingredient, DHA, can lead to much more effect. So we do have to consider the whole and not the individual. Okay, and that's what I, my next question is, how much of these can we supplement? Like what if people don't like fish and they're not big fish eaters, can they take um, omega-3 um, and, and supplement it? And does it do the same thing um, that it would gaining it from actually eating the food? Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think taking supplements can be as good as taking diverse foods. Now, having said that, the, the, the bigger, more complex questions that we don't have an answer to is, can people have a healthy, let's say vegan or vegetarian diet that excludes fish? And can this diet stand alone without taking supplements? I, I don't think we know. I think some people would advocate for taking omega-3 supplements because those diets are deficient in fish. But some people would say that there are vegetarians and vegan populations you know, we can talk about countries like India and other places where they have little access to fish and they don't have an epidemic of Alzheimer's dementia. So mm -hmm. the point is, if you have a healthy diet that contains diverse uh, entities, you may not need particular supplementation. Now, that's a general population advice. My lab is interested in a specific gene variant known as APOE4. E4 in white individuals, ethnicity is quite important here, is associated with an increase in the risk of dementia. And E4 carriers who have very low levels of omega-3s have more dementia than E4 carriers who have good levels of omega-3s. So we're testing a hypothesis that raising the amount of omega-3s in E4 carriers might make a difference. This okay. This might be is, very specific and personalized, may not yeah. apply to the general population. Okay, this is really interesting. And so for most people like among who are regular watchers know what E4, but just to explain it to people who are watching who might not, um, APOE4 is otherwise known as the Alzheimer's gene. You can have um, one copy um, from one parent and that's called heterozygous and two copies is because you got one copy from each parent and that's homozygous, your risk goes up um, uh, if you obviously have have two copies. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit because what I'm interested in and I've been told that APOE is an important cholesterol transport gene. Is that true? Um, not exactly. It's, it's, it's a lipid carrier. Cholesterol is one of the components in lipids. It transports cholesterol, but it's not just a, a, a cholesterol transporter. So when we're talking about a deficiency in omega-3 leading to a higher risk of, of Alzheimer's in the E4 population, what specifically is interesting about that in terms of the gene versus, you know, um, what they are or aren't getting or processing? I don't know how to um, state it. <laughs> so let's assume the analogy that I give is that different engines of different cars may have different requirements. If you, For example, if you buy a Lamborghini or a really expensive car and you take it to a repair shop or take it to the dealer, they would tell you, well, this kind of engine will require certain oils, high-grade oils for that engine to have a given life. If you kind of use poorer engine oils, the car can still run, but it's likely that you're decreasing the lifespan of that engine. And in my mind, and this is too simplistic, but perhaps can serve a point that the E4 brain requires higher quality oils to keep firing at a certain rate. And if, they're, if it's not supplied by that high quality oil, at some point compared to a different engine, you would see a, you know, the, the, the actual engine light. And that's what, one of the signs of dementia. What are the best uh, sources for omega-3? Is it mainly fish? Where, where, which foods would give us the best source of omega-3? Um, I would probably say plant-based omega-3s are as good as sea, seafood-based omega-3s. You can get omega-3s from nuts. You can get omega-3s from um, algae, uh, which is really how 
uh, fatty fish get their own seafood uh, among the actual fatty fish uh, you know groups salmon red herring sardines have the highest concentrations so so basically there's many sources um, that doesn't mean people have to be binging on fatty fish the requirement isn't that huge but what we're trying to say is that in a very unique specific population at risk of dementia more research and we are part of those groups that are interested in finding out whether increasing omega-3s in this subpopulation can make a difference and we don't know if it does yeah that's a that's an interesting question it's kind of like the vitamin d question like is like a, a lot of in epidemiological studies uh it was found that people with dementia have lower d but is that cause or is that you know it, like is it, is it yeah effect uh we have a question from rachel who's asking she said i've heard claims about the keto diet and brain health but that diet seems restrictive and not diverse um but it's high in fat do you have an opinion on the ketogenic diet which is that's a great question i was actually thinking that myself yeah so we have a paper that's going to get published in the next couple of months in nutrition reviews that looks at all diets for apoe4 carriers and uh, we go into all individual diets, including the ketogenic diet. And I, I would, my opinion is based on my understanding of the literature, is that a ketogenic diet is a little bit restrictive and can be hard to maintain, um, but has good elements. So you have to be creative and go beyond simply a ketogenic diet, meaning if you can get a get away with a ketogenic diet based on good fats from plants, that's probably a good diet. But if you go onto a ketogenic diet living on steak, that's probably not a great diet. So ketogenic by itself doesn't give us enough information to tell you if it's a good or a bad diet. A ketogenic diet is by definition simply a low carb diet. However, yeah. there are carbs that are good and there are fats that 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 are relatively not as good. So I would just walk away from just being a ketogenic diet and think about the components of the diet itself. Okay. So I've also, um, it's been, you know, glucose is obviously, that's the natural fuel for our brains. And as we age, we, I've been told we metabolize glucose less efficiently. Um, ketones are an alternative source of fuel for our brains because they actually cross the brain blood barrier. So do you have an opinion on really varying, changing, maybe, you know, maybe a ketogenic diet all the time isn't good, but maybe for specific periods of time so that perhaps you are changing en energy sources. And, and I guess it's the same relationship with intermittent fasting, right? So if we go for a period of time um, without food, then we start to burn ketones. So what do we know about that in terms of how to sustain energy in our brain and if it's actually good for us? Okay, so let me just, try to explain a little bit. So it is true that glucose metabolism in the brain is decreased as we age, and it's this decrease is accentuated in disease like Alzheimer's. But that's not simply crossing into the brain. That's the whole metabolism of glucose. So we don't really know how much of that decrease is a function of transport into the brain versus actual lower metabolism by the brain cells themselves. And I would argue that we don't know much about ketone brain uptake in disease states because um, there is some studies that su suggesting that in patients that carry the APOE4 allele, the brain may not be efficiently capable of breaking down ketones to generate ATP as a replacement for glucose. So to make the assumption that if the brain cannot use glucose, it can use ketones instead, I don't think that's fully supported. Now, having said that, I, the concept that I'm trying your listeners and readers to understand is that diversity is really good. And diversity could, could mean that you're alternating your sources of energy, sometimes coming from glucose, sometimes coming from fat or ketones. And having a diverse form of energy in general is, is, is a good idea. And what, whether that means switching on and off or having intermittent fasting or intermittent or time restricted diets i think there's some good science to support that 
Okay, and then we have another question coming in about, um, this is from Terry, and Terry is asking, um, Dr. Yassine mentioned plant-based. Can he be more specific about plant-based? My doctor recently told me to stay away from plant-based, like impossible burgers, impossible chicken, like the, the fake meats, right? Um, any any um, advice on that? Absolutely. So I would refer to a paper we published, I think, uh, either this year or last year on, on a journal called the um, uh, Cur Cur Current Opinion in Nutrition, where we talk about plant-based fats and their sources. In, in, in a nutshell, the less processed, the better. The less processed, the better. So if you are ingesting extremely processed forms of fat, whether it's meat or it's plant-based, uh, there are ingredients which we don't fully understand, and they may be packaged in preservatives that allows them to last, you know, six months or more on the shelf. So we don't really know what that means. But if you go back to plant-based diets that we've had for many, many, many years, and, you know, when we talk about fats, we're talking about seeds, nuts, we're, we're talking about many sources of fat, avocados, as an example, has a lot of good fat. Um, you know, avocados is a monounsaturated fat. Uh, nuts like almonds and, and, and walnuts have polyunsaturated fats. Um, uh, coconut has saturated fats. These are all healthy fats coming from plants. So a plant source of fat is generally a healthy fat. Mm. What about, um, so anything processed then is because we're probably breaking down and losing some of that valuable, right? Um, some of the valuable um, attributes of that, that food. What about with the APOE4 population? Do we know overall, like, I mean, I know, you know, it's kind of like, you need to minimize risk where, and, and assist, assess your risk. If you have a genetic risk, um, I guess the question is still how big a role can lifestyle adjustments like exercise and diet play in terms of kind of staving off Alzheimer's, right? It's not to say you'll never get Alzheimer's, but there's how good is the literature to say that we can, anyone for that matter, not only the E4 population, kick the can down the road um, with um, adjustments to our diet or yeah. living a healthy life? Excellent question. And the answer is, it is good. And, and the reason why we say that is because not all APOE4 carriers get dementia. That's particularly true with heterozygotes, which have one copy. So if we assume, you know, you're, we're following E4 carriers, we see that a small portion of them, less than 25% of those carriers will get dementia and maybe 75% or more will not get dementia. So why are they protected? When you might argue, well, maybe they have other genetic factors that protect them, and that's true, but often genetics doesn't explain a lot of why these individuals are not getting dementia. Often it is lifestyle, it's exercise, it's diet, it's stress, it is social integration, connections. It's being you know, less stressed, less anxious, less depressed, it's being um, mentally, cognitively stimulated. So I, I think as we study more why some people get dementia and others, we're learning that certain habits and patterns can be protective. And unfortunately, clinical trials often have limitations in terms of their design or duration that may not allow us to mimic epidemiology. Yeah. So are you, uh, do you practice what you preach? Do you eat really a diverse diet and healthy diet? I mean, I know doctors sometimes can be the worst people, right? To take care of themselves. I, I, I try, I try to, but I have to admit that we all ha have our, our vices and sometimes we have our weak points, especially when we are stressed out. Um, I think, you know, I'm discovering myself. I've tried different diets. I've been on, you know, all kinds of different foods just to see what my body likes and what not. And what I've, I've discovered from my personal journey is that, you know, sometimes you have to understand what you, what you can do and what, what you can't do. Which diet can, can you take? And the, the idea is sustainability. I want to be on a diet I like. I enjoy eating. It's I don't want to force myself to eat something I don't like. And I can tell you based on my own personal experiences is that if you look deep enough, you'll find a lot of combination of foods that are very appetizing and they don't have to be quite restrictive. 
um, it's just a luxury. Can we have the time? Can we have the resources? Can we create uh, an environment that allows us to enjoy what we eat? Yeah, absolutely. And and I also think, I mean, to a certain extent, we're all built differently. So it's very complex, right? So the way that I metabolize something may be completely different from how you do. And, and how closely is the way we metabolize um, linked to the benefits of food? Um, it has definitely a role and metabolism changes across, you know, race, ethnicity, disease states, but I would tell you that it, it is not a major determinant. What's a major determinant is, is possibly access to food, uh, social economic status, uh, stress. Um, I mean, you could take populations, identical populations, for example. Uh, the, the classic example is E4 carriers in Nigeria. Uh, there have been studies where they followed these individuals who have one or two copies of E4 and they migrated from Nigeria to a suburb in Indiana. And they've looked at how much, how many or what percentage of these people got dementia. And they've found out that, you know, a lot more got dementia in a westernized diet in the US compared to their traditional diet in Africa. That also holds true for Japanese populations, Asian populations, and even Indian populations that stayed in India versus migrated to England. Mm -hmm. So the, the long story short, Genetics haven't really changed in Nigerians who went to Indiana and Indians who traveled to England and Japanese who traveled to the US. The metabolism possibly is similar, but what has changed is the exposure to fast food, uh, the less active lifestyle, more processed food, faster life, more stress, and those add up and take a toll, toll on the brain. Okay, so my my next question is sugar. Is sugar the root of all evil, or what? Where what do we need to know about sugar? Okay, so I would say simple sugar is pretty bad. Complex sugar is not as bad. So simple sugar, let's is the like like the processed sugar, the white sugar, right? Is that simple sugar? Simple sugar, like white sugar, but Refined. white sugar, yeah, white sugar is not as bad as syrup. So the, think about it is. The more concentrated it is and the more consumed at higher concentration and has a rapid access to your liver, the more likely it's going to induce different bad things. The more dilute it is, the more it's spread out within the fiber of your orange or complexed with a potato starch, the less damaging it is. So this is not just labeling sugar. It's the dynamics of sugar, sugar metabolism, absorption, and so forth. Is that why when we, you know, they say, a, like say, I was wearing a glucose monitor for a while because I just wanted to understand how I metabolize food and, you know, certain combinations of food can offset, right, the 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 risk of other, of, of certain foods. Is that true? Like if you eat sugar with fiber, then it's not as bad or, you yeah. know. So yeah. let me give you an example. They follow tribes in Brazil and Bolivia. And they actually, you know, colleagues of ours have looked at their diets. They're not obese. They don't have diabetes. They don't have heart disease. They don't have dementia. And you'd think, oh, well, they're eating a lot of good fat. They're eating a lot of omega-3s. That wasn't the case. They would actually, 90% of their diet or so was Yukon potatoes. This is starch. This is sugar. So, I mean, we have to be humble and recognize that if you can adapt in, a, in an environment where you walk an average of 17,000 steps per day, you can adapt and take complex sugars and burn them and convert them into something else. Yeah. And you don't react the same way. If you took the same Hazdas population or Bolivian population, Shemane, or Brazilian population, move them to the US, stop them from walking 17,000 steps a day, and give them, you know, Coke and simple sugars, you'll see something completely different. Yeah, it's so interesting because when I was wearing my glucose monitor, I eat a lot of pasta, um, but I run every day. I'm a runner. And so pasta didn't impact my metabolism. I never spiked when I ate pasta. And someone was explaining to me, well, because it's because you run all the time. You know, when you run, you're burning off those, those um, carbohydrates. So it truly is. It's worth the exercise to wear a glucose monitor because then you understand how you metabolize food better. Right. And, and you know, exercising 
means that you are shuttling glucose to certain areas to break them down as opposed to creating fat or triglycerides. So it's a completely different network or fate when people are exercising versus people sitting and watching TV. The yeah. same diet can lead to different effects. And that's why they say, oh, take a walk after dinner, right? It does a world of wonder before you go to bed. And that's also why there's good science about having your bigger meal, maybe between 10 and 2, because this is when you're most active. Yeah, I know. I really like dinner, though. I. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, what? Where is the research going next? Tell us where what we're looking for. What do we need to find out next? Yeah, in, in the world of nutrition and the brain, there's two kinds of research going. There's personalized research where you take a population like E4 carriers and give them customized recommendations based on their own dietary needs, their brain consumption. But there's also large, big scale uh, population research where it's going to, toward resources and affordability and making tomatoes cheaper than, for example, burgers. So, so we have to think two things when we talk about nutrition and the brain. We have to look at the population level. What are the barriers from accessing real food? How can we make real food cheap? And how can we make processed food expensive? And this is regulatory to some extent. And on a personalized level, if you knew that you had certain genes or certain risk, is there something you can do today to prevent dementia a decade later? Yeah. That is very, very good way to look at it. And I like that idea of getting chips and making them like 10 times in price, right? And and giving people, you know, I mean, why should avocados be expensive, right? <laughs> right. I think we, if, if we tax soda, let's not talk about chips. If we tax soda the same way we tax cigarettes, you'd have less people drinking soda. Okay, you just reminded me of one thing and then I'll let you go. Alcohol. I mean, there's so much mixed information around alcohol in the brain. Um, what's your take on it? I, I would say it depends on what kind of alcohol, moderate cons consumption, um, in the context of a good dietary pattern is okay. But excessive alcohol consumption in the context of a poor diet is, is, is bad. I, again, I step away from individualized components yeah. of the diet and let's look at the big picture. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, that this was a very good reminder to do exactly that because we tend to want to know, okay, what food, what should I do? You know, and it's it's the combination. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuzin. This was fascinating conversation. Please keep us abreast of the research. Uh, this is obviously a topic that appeals to everyone, um, especially people who are impacted by Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, so please keep us um, posted. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, inviting me and I'm happy to share what we know. And if any of you missed any of this interview, please go to our website. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. That's where we post about um, interviews like Dr. Yassin. Thanks everyone for watching and we will see you next time. Have a great weekend.